everybody, welcome back to the Politics with Roger Political Science 101 video blog series. We're all the way up to lesson number 13 in our uh, Political Science 101 class series. Uh, thanks guys for everyone who stuck around. Uh, before I dive into lesson number 13, let's just take a quick review of what we've done. And uh, I, I just want to remind everybody what the goal is here. The goal is here is for everybody to get the highest understanding, the best understanding of politics in the shortest amount of time possible. Even if you're a beginner, even if you knew nothing about politics, nothing about political science, if you start from the introduction and, and work your way through these classes, I think you'll get a very good idea of what's going on in politics and political science uh, in a very short amount of time, all things considered. Uh, lessons number one through five created kind of a foundation for us. Uh, it, we started with lesson number one, power, influence, and authority. Uh, lessons two and three were about politics from the right and politics from the left. Uh, lesson four was about communication, and lesson five was about information. Or it might be the other way around, but anyway, three, uh, lessons four and five were about information and communication. Uh, lessons 6 through 12, what we've just completed, uh, started with philosophers and philosophies of the 1776 revolution and constitution of the United States, what I would consider politics from the right. Uh, and then we've just been covering um, some very important amendments, rights that we have protected in our Bill of Rights. Uh, we, uh, uh, the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and Tenth Amendment. So now here with lesson number 13, we're going to start looking at uh, the politics from the left, take a little bit closer look at uh, here. Lesson 13 is going to be all about philosophers and philosophies from the left. And uh, we'll spend the next class or two talking about some of the political systems from the left. All right. And then when we're finished with this uh, uh, short, uh, this closer look at these systems on the left, uh, then we'll round out the Political Science 101 class with a little bit of discussion about economics and economic systems, uh, sociology, anthropology, and of course religion. And then we can move on to the 200 series class and get into a more in-depth detail on a lot of the things that we're talking about. But anyway, thanks for sticking around, guys. And, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed putting these classes together because uh, I've been reminded about a lot of things that I've forgotten. And it's making me see things more clearly uh, in the world that are going on and how they apply. And, you know, I th they hel it helps me out, too. So, anyways, I thank everybody for that. Anyway, so when we review... Uh, you know, what we're discussing here, going all the way back to lesson number two, the struggle between the left and the right um, is basically just a struggle between the centralization of power versus the decentralization of power. It's pretty much that simple when we talk about, uh, uh, well, I won't even say Democrat and Republican anymore because, um, th you know, th those definitions and those, uh, uh, well, the political party system has gotten so crazy that, um, they've gotten away a little bit from their, uh, a lot from their original intent. But the initial uh, struggle between left and right was always about the centralization of power and the decentralization of power. Nothing more, nothing less. Now this can be illustrated vertically in the uh, kind of the in that into the triangle in that pyramid um, uh, uh, illustration that we have, where basically you have the what we would call today in our society the one percent at the top and the 99% uh, underneath the 1%. And it's the same kind of struggle where uh, the 1% is centralizing power and uh, you know the 99% is basically decentral uh, decentralizing power. Uh, but it's not quite that simple, is it? I mean, uh, uh, you know, and that's why we discuss these political systems. But in general, that's what the vertical uh, illustration of left and right would look like. It would, it would look like the pyramid, um, the pyramid system. Uh, and on top, you have, you know, the ruling class. Uh, for many, many, for centuries, it's royalty, monarchy, or just, uh, uh, you know, rulers that uh, had all the power, the strong man kind of ruler. Um, 
underneath that you have the means of production, which we're going to be talking about much more. Uh, in the medieval times, it was your lords, but it always comes back to the means of productions. In, in modern times, it's the industrialists. Uh, you know, we think about the oil industry, energy sector, uh, and uh, now in 2021, at the at, it's February 2021 at the creation of this video. Uh, now, big tech is a big part of. Uh, that control system that is coming in, uh, big, uh, uh, big medical, the, the medical industry, you, you see all this kind of consolidation, but it's the 1% and the 99% representation in the vertical. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of what that looks like. So when we get into talking about the philosophers and philosophies of the left, I want to actually start with the founding fathers of 1776, and a lot of you know, and a lot of people might say, "Hey, Roger, what do you mean the uh, the founding fathers of 1776?" I thought we just spent six classes uh, talking about the Constitution and how um, that was about decentralization of power. So, what could the founding fathers possibly? Uh, wh why would we even consider them a part of the left at all? And uh, I would consider 1776 and the, what our founding fathers did uh, was created classic liberalism. Classic liberalism. And, you know, I've talked about this in previous classes. Now, we, we have what we call a republic, and we, we've, we've mentioned that before. And a republic uh, by Webster's Dictionary is defined by elections and uh, elected representatives uh, and, and the people, uh, the 99% will, you know, for lack of better term, uh, uh, choose their leaders and are have all the power, right? Um, but there still has to be something that governs all that, that holds all that together because the elective representatives come in and out. And the centralization of power falls into uh, the document, the law, where basically the law becomes the power that holds the republic together. In the case of the United States, it's the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights. So instead of uh, um, just manpower uh, centralizing the power, it's the document itself that protects the power. And that's where classic liberalism was born. Um, because it was a centralizing, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a document that centralizes power. It was an act that centralized power to a federal government. Um, because the federal government's job, if you recall, is to protect the Bill of Rights, to protect the United States Constitution. It wasn't supposed to go beyond that, and it has, but that's a discussion for later. But just the concept, and we're just talking about concepts. I'm not going to get into good and bad so much. I'm going to try not to. We'll just, we'll just get down to intent and what it was designed to do. Um, the Republic is defined by... The United, uh, the United States Constitution are the legal document that holds the republic together. And that's an act of centralization of power. That's why I call that classic liberalism uh, uh, because, you know, this actually gave us rights. And, uh, you know, for the classic liberals out there, and I'd consider myself a classic liberal, you know, the whole live and let live, um, you know, that this template was created by the founding fathers of 1776 and it allowed the states uh, to experiment and to vary and, and also have their own sovereignty. We just talked about that in the 10th Amendment class and this created a lot of freedom. But, uh, any, but that's basically 1776, the founding fathers. Classic liberalism was created and I'll also mention that real capitalism was created because it created the, uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of ownership uh, or I shouldn't say it didn't create the concept, but it opened up the idea of ownership uh, for even the 99%. Uh, throughout most of history, going back to that vertical representation, um, it was basically some kind of form of feudalism or serfdom, or basically even just slaves, where you had the power, uh, uh, the royalty and power, you had what, what they called in the medieval era lords, but it, it's the same throughout history. We call them today industrialists. Um, you know, the, the mega wealthy, the, the people who are running corporations, whatever, the people who are controlling the means of production. You have a military class who, you know, uh, protects uh, the 1% from everybody else, and then you have everybody else. Uh, but in classic liberalism, in 1776 liberalism, uh, the idea was that the 99% could vertically integrate themselves. Uh, you know, the 99% could break into the 1%. 
um, through their own uh, uh, ingenuity, intuition, hard work, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, 1776, the founding fathers deserve credit for uh, classic liberalism. Uh, moving on, we'll talk briefly about Karl Marx, longly considered the father of communism. Um, now, I have to give Karl Marx, I mean, we, we beat Karl Marx up, and, you know, I, I beat up communism, but in fairness to Karl Marx, um, Marx recognized something that's very true. He said, look, in capitalism, we still get the 1% who control the 99% because it's the 1%, the capitalists, um, who control the means of production. Uh, you know, looking into it, I don't know how much Marx acknowledged the fact that somebody could rise from obscurity and can uh, break into the 1% because before 1776 capitalism, that really didn't exist. Um, or, or it was extremely rare. And some can argue, hey, it's extremely rare in modern day America as well. And, you know, we could, we could have that debate. That's, that's a debate that we could have. But Karl Marx stated that um, capitalism was still an unfair system where the 1% controlled the 99%. Um, and that uh, uh, basically that, uh, that, well, basically the 99% were still being screwed by capitalism. So his answer to that basically was, um, well, anyway, backing up before his answer, he said that it was a false consciousness, a false consciousness. It was a ruse. The idea of the 99% or someone from the 99% breaking into the 1% was uh, really a fantasy, a ruse, uh, a false consciousness is what they, they called it. And that as soon as the people figure that out, revolution would become inevitable. And you know, was Karl Marx wrong um, in theory? Well, we can argue that. We can debate that because, you know, a lot of people even today believe a false consciousness exists. And as more and more of our constitution in America gets chipped away, you do see it is harder and harder for someone from the 99% to rise into the 1%. Um, you know, the freer the nation, I think, you know, the easier it is for someone from the 99% to break into the 1%. But you still see this struggle between the consolidation of power, uh, the 1% controlling the means of production, and those of us in the 99% trying to break into or trying to rise through that system into the 1%. Um, of course, this assumes that everybody in the 99% is trying to break into the 1%. And that's a whole other discussion to have, too, because... I'm in the 99% and I'm not trying to break into the 1%. It seems like a lot of work and a headache to me. But but you get the point. Um, as a political system, this created classes, the elites and everyone else. Karl Marx called them uh, the bourgeoisie, uh, uh, the, the bourgeoisie, the 1%, and the proletariat. Um, in other systems, it was called the elites and uh, uh, the serfs. Whatever you want to say, it's the same dynamic new language, and this is what Karl Marx believed. He believes that we were uh, heading towards inevitable uh, confrontation in capitalism uh, and uh, that the proletariat, the 99% would rise up and topple the capitalists or the 1%, those who controlled the means of production. And we'll talk about some of the results of those in later classes. So moving on, uh, you know, I chose Saul Alinsky as a more modern-day uh, uh, philosopher from the left. He was a very important philosopher. He wrote the book Rules for Radicals. We covered this uh, in in uh, lesson number three, and we'll get into it even more in later lessons because we're just giving overviews. But again, just to review the Saul Alinsky dynamic in politics from the left, uh, basically Saul Alinsky wanted to accelerate that revolution. So... He believed Karl Marx or anybody from the left um, who who subscribes to that ideology believes, yeah, the capitalists are screwing the uh, the bourgeoisie, they're screwing the the the, the proletariat, the ninety nine percent, and there needs to be a revolution uh, of the ninety nine percent to control the means of production. So what did Saul Alinsky do that was new? Well, he accelerated that. Um, he called for revolution and he created a book that rules for radicals uh, that, that um, instructed the proletariat in tactics that would accelerate the revolution. You know, no, really nothing more, nothing less. But um, this was a very aggressive posture for the proletariat to take. Um, basically, I guess Alinsky is a, a, a testimony of uh, someone who 
truly believes that the false consciousness is a false consciousness. Um, you see, I guess that's the difference between someone like me and someone like Alinsky. It's, it all comes down to that false consciousness um, concept because I still believe as a, 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 a capitalist American um, that the 99% can break into the 1% where someone like Alinsky says, no, that, that's, that's false, that's a ruse. It's time for the proletariat to rise up and to take the means of production away uh, from those who have it now. So, very important. And then finally, we reach a whole different side of the left, and that's globalism. And, you know, this is defined by thinkers like Henry, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, um, you know, it started with the League of Nations and the UN, um, it, you know, and then Kissinger, basically, uh, uh, the idea, Kissinger pushed uh, real politic, which was basically uh, a philosophy that said, hey, we need to think in a more pragmatic order. Um, those who have the means of production are responsible for the distribution of goods and services to those who cannot have it. So, Real politic throws out ideology, political ideology, and it throws out morality, uh, or, or I shouldn't say it throws out morality, but it throws out systems of morality, and it basically says, I mean, to me, it was another way of saying, well, if you got the power, then then you have the right to rule. Uh, we can debate that. I'm sure Kissinger would dress it up in a little bit different way, but uh, this is basically what the globalist movement has been about. Those who have the power deserve to exercise the power. The reason they deserve to exercise the power is because they have it. I see circular logic in that, but that, you know, it, it, there, there is a debate to have about that. I mean, it's, um, you know, there is a lot of third world countries or countries that are in poverty, countries that are broken, and it does beg the question, what responsibility do those with all the means of production have to distributing that wealth and power to those nations that don't have it? Now, you know, some of those nations might say, we don't want, you know, what you have. Um, they might say that's a very materialistic way to view the world. But what Kissinger and a lot of the globalists were saying, and, and, and I'll throw Zbigniew, uh, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in, in with Kissinger as well, um, they were saying, well, we have the, the power and the means of production, and it's our responsibility uh, to take care of those who don't all around the world. This is where we see that one world government coming into play. Uh, Brzezinski was big with the Trilateral Commission with David Rockefeller. Um, so even though these players maybe didn't, uh, they, they worked in a loose network, uh, almost a cabal, um, which might not be the most fair word, or maybe it's the exact perfect word but um anyway you see where leftism is going and this is all about centralization of power because particularly uh since the 60s it's been the united states china and russia uh and then later the the eu uh defined by the un and and certain middle east powers who have all begun consolidating power into one uh global network um, and that's globalism that we see today. So just to review, the philosophers and the philosophies of the left, starting with the, the 1776, the founding fathers of the United States, uh, the United States Constitution, the Republic, and classic liberalism, uh, moving on to Karl Marx and uh, the father of communism, Saul Alinsky, who accelerated uh, uh, communism and the great uh, uh, conflict between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the 1% and the 99%, and then uh, bringing us where we are today with uh, globalism, one world government, and thinkers that believe in cent centralization of power uh, for the sake of uh, for, uh, the centralization of power to those that have it because they can. So anyway, I find that uh, it's an interesting progression. I hope uh, I hope you guys, uh, if you have any comments or want to debate it or talk about it, feel free to drop a comment anytime. And uh, those are the philosophers and philosophies from the left. I know I could have included a lot more, but this video is already hitting on 20 minutes, and, you know, I try to keep it shorter than that. Um, we will definitely be diving more into each of these situations, uh, into each of these ideas and concepts in uh, the lessons coming up. And, uh, yeah, philosophers and philosophies from the left. Uh, lesson number 13. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you for lesson number 14, where we're going to discuss again some of these different systems of classic liberalism, uh, legalism, 
communism, socialism, fascism, and what they mean. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys later. Yeah.